Okay, hello, hello everybody. Here we are starting our workshop today. It's advanced studio lighting today. My name is Eric Torres, an instructor here at CAN-TV. Thank you for joining us. And um, today we're gonna be going through an overview of studio lighting, but into a little bit of depth so that you can maybe plan your own show with something more than just the usual basic lighting setup. So there's gonna be a lot of fun stuff to look at today. We will walk through it. Uh, the first thing I wanna say though is the, as you can see, I'm wearing a mask. So today, you know, the situation is going to be probably uh, for the foreseeable future, it's gonna be like this where we have certain requirements. So we're gonna ask people to please wear masks when they come to CAN TV, uh, sign in when you get here, and also respect some of the limits of the, the room capacities. So the studio that we're in right now, the large studio, uh, there are two crew members allowed in this space and a maximum of four people on the set as talent. So that would be six people total in this large space. In the control room, you're gonna have a limit of only two people. The uh, CAN-TV uh, personnel will not be in the same room. We will be hovering outside in the hallway. Just for safety, we don't want too many people in one room. Um, you also have a limit of one person in the green room and one person in the prop room. So, you know, um, there are other things we're accommodating. If you have props to bring in, we're gonna encourage you to bring them in through the alleyway. So you can bring, bring your cart next to the door there, we'll open the door for you. There's the, all those sorts of things will still make it possible for you to make a show. The show will be more obviously a little more uh, streamlined, less crew people. And we're trying to think of creative ways to expand upon that and, and have other possibilities. So that's a work in progress. But the studio is open. Reservations are being taken. So uh, the time slot is the same, it's a three hour time slot. And you still have to do the show within those three hours. So anyway, those are the ground rules. So hopefully you will take advantage and still make shows and come to CAN TV. And those of you that haven't become certified yet, talk to us in the training department. We'll be happy to talk to you. Uh, we have not set up classes as of yet. We are still working on a protocol for classes. We'll talk about that later. We can chat about that later. You can email us and all that if you have concerns. So let's get started with our advanced studio lighting workshop. Follow me and I'll show you the set. Um, we've set up a lighting setup that we think is somewhat typical. Uh, you know, we've got these cast of characters here. You know, we're a little short on personnel, so we had to recruit some people uh, kind of a little bit randomly. But these are what we're gonna call today our lighting models, They're st or stand-ins. So typically, you can bring a person in as a stand-in, but you know, we're basically, um, since we're limiting how many people are coming into the studio, we are going to ask you to just use your actual talent not some other people to substitute. So bring your actual talent in and do the lighting accordingly. Now, the plan for this workshop is to talk about preparation, actual guts of, you know, the nuts and bolts of actual lighting. We're gonna get up on a ladder, show you a few things up on a light. All this is designed to stimulate your imagination for lighting. Uh, typically, like I said, you got three hours in the studio Lighting normally is, should be accomplished within the first hour. That gives you a nice margin of time to actually do your show. Leaves you at least you know, more than an hour to actually shoot it. You have to also strike the set, break everything down. You have to transfer your recording off of our drive. Or maybe you wanna learn how to take advantage of the new capability we have where you can plug your own drive into the system and, and stream directly to it. You know, that's another possibility. But that anyway, three hour time window is what you've got. And typically an hour for lighting. So the lighting setup you see here right now, this did honestly take more than an hour. It, it was necessary because this is a special workshop. We have to demonstrate certain things. So it, it took time. But if this was an actual show, you know, our goal would have been one hour, get it lit. So how can that happen? An hour is such a short time. Well, obviously planning. It all comes back to phase one of production, pre-production. You've got to plan your production well, and that includes your lighting. Now with lighting, 
we have a plot, we have a lighting plot that we make available where you can like plan your lighting. So your lighting situation is a, as follows here. You can see the number of instruments we have. It's, it's a pretty good number. The long skinny ones that are around the edges are your psych lights or cyclorama lights. And so uh, the beams, as you can see, are pointing towards the curtain. And so that, those are pretty easy because the ones on the left are all fader one. The ones in the back are fader two, and then you got fader three on the right. So all those are controlled with one fader. You just have to decide how bright to make them and what color to make them. And maybe in relation to each other, how you want to blend them. Then you've got your set in the middle, your risers, that dark gray square uh, rectangle there. And you can see all the other lights are aimed towards that. And your uh, Fresnel lights, uh, the ones with the lenses on the front that are adjustable, have adjustable beams, are the little square ones there. And then you've got astrolites, which are the long skinny little uh, strips there. Those are arrays of LEDs. Those are LED lights. And so those are your different choices. And there's a few extra things in there. There's some two party lights. You can see the party lights are down toward the bottom, lights number 19. You've got the party lights, which are like little flashing lights that can be you know, dazzling your set, just kind of you know, tickling your set with little flashes of light. We're going to try to get that going. There we go. These are your party lights. So if you've got a show that needs to be a little bit more upbeat, try your party lights. Now we also have an ellipsoidal light, which is number 20. And number 20 is for a cookie. You can make a cookie. I made one for the show. I made it right before the show. It, it took me less than 10 minutes to cast a pattern on your set. And so your cookie is, you know, we've talked about this in our classes, as you can see, it faded up. Um, it's typically, I'll show you in a second, it's made, you can hand make one or you can get one ordered to be made. You can, we can provide you a resource list that can give you some ideas on where you get your cookie made. Uh, cookie stands for Cucaloris, some people call it a gobo. We also can point you to a catalog, to a company that uh, creates these gobos. And the price, you know, if we want to talk price, they're not cheap. Um, they basically start at $100 and go up from there, depending on how elaborate you want it to be. So there you see, that's the ellipsoidal light that you're looking at there. And the cookie is in a, a little holder, a slot, in the middle of the light up on the top. And you typically will take the cookie. It's a little metal sheet. You're going to put it in that holder that you see sticking up. And you're going to flip it upside down and backwards because the lenses of the light reverse the image. They reverse it horizontally and vertically. So, so to, to do the cookie, you just put it in the slot, stick it in there, adjust the angle of your light. And um, the beam, as far as like how sharp or soft you want it to be, there's all these knobs on the light. And the angle, where it is on your set. We also put a little blue gel in front of the ellipsoidal light. I just taped it on with gaffer's tape. Uh, so yeah, our lighting fixtures in here don't have gel holders. They don't have any kind of a rig for that. But it's OK because they're all LED. They're cool lights. They don't get hot. As you can see, there's a blue gel just taped and hanging there in front of the ellipsoidal. Um, so yeah, you can give your, your lighting a different color, make it a little more interesting. So it's just one of the ways we have of jazzing up your set, making it look more interesting. And that was a quick fix. Um, you know, it took me, like I said, less than 10 minutes to make the cookie. It took me about five minutes to put it in a light and adjust it and slap a gel on it. So little things like that can make a big difference. Now, back to planning for a moment. Let me um, talk about that. You're planning, of course, you have a lot to plan for your show. You've got the topic of your show and who's going to be the talent and the host. And you've got to also decide on the look. You know, that's something we emphasize at Can TV, not just the substance of the show, but the look of the show. Because the look of the show is part of your storytelling. People will pay attention to it. They will tune in and stay tuned in longer if the show is visually interesting. And so lighting is crucial. Lighting is a key part of that. But lighting works hand in hand with set design, with, with costume, with clothing, all, a lot of things to take into consideration. How do these things work together? And how do you want to, what do you want to call attention to? 
I'm always talking about calling attention to things in my workshops because we have to call attention with our, to people's eye. Where do we want their eye to look? So this table in front of me here, it was white. It is a white table. Look how white that table is. And so if it was just a white table, it would detract attention. You know, it, it's the brightest object in the scene is what people's eyes will look at first. They were in their, their eye will even stay there for a while. This is too bright, this table, which is why we threw, you know, some cloth over it. And now it's toned down. It's not detracting attention, you know, from our fabulous, you know, cast of characters here. And so speaking of these characters, these people, these talent, um, this guy over here on the far side here, this guy, he did not maybe get talked to properly because he's wearing gray tones here that just mush into the set. They blend into the set. He doesn't stand out much at all. I mean, the only thing that stands out is his face. But yeah, clothing-wise, he's just blending into this. The, the carpet is gray. You know, it's just not a good look. So somebody should have said, hey, man, whoever comes onto the set should bring an alternative piece of clothing, something that's, that's substantially different um, from what they're wearing, you know, when they walk in the door. So we should, people should, have, should bring choices, think different colors that people can wear. I would have had, you know, neutral colors are good. Beige, brown, maybe light orange, green like he's wearing over there. The red's pretty good. You know, so you have to, you have to, you know, the lighting is only going to work if, if the talent is properly prepared. Um, now, makeup could also be part of that. Sometimes the lights will make you shine. Um, a lot of things can happen. So part of your planning is, okay, what kind of colors do we want people to wear? Avoid stripes and things like that. Little shiny earrings. No, that's not good either. That can catch the light. So people should be properly prepared. Then you can start you know, thinking the rest of the set. It would have been nice to have a carpet down here, some kind of orange or you know, beige carpet, something other than this gray platform that we're standing on. So we encourage you to bring in your own props like that, bring in carpets and things like that that will make, make people focus on the area that people are in. Otherwise, they just all kind of blend into the background. So then, anyway, the set is crucial. So you're going to set up your set first, then do your lighting. Now, the way you set up your set, it's going to be in relation to that lighting. And so some of the lights in here are, all of the lights in here are fixed in position. Can't really move them around. You can, you can tilt them. You can pan them. Some of them you can. You can focus, you can spot them, you can flood them, you can put things in front of them, but you just can't unbolt them and move them around. They're in position. So when I do a set, when I situate my chairs and things, I take the backlights first into first consideration. And a backlight, as you know, three-point lighting is coming from the back. Backlighting will help you stand out from the background. And so the fellow right here, I'm calling him the host. He's lined up. He's lined up with a, with one of these lights up here. He's he's square with with a, what we're calling a backlight. Okay, and so that will help him stand out from the background. And so then, you know, not just the position of the backlight, but also what kind of backlight is it? Is it a Fresnel light? Is it an Astra light? Just to just to define the terms here, Astrolite is the big square panel with all the little LEDs. It's like an array of LEDs. The Fresnel light is more like a, a light with a lens on the front that can really focus the light or flood it out. It has much more flexibility, much more adjustability. So typically, we're going to, there's a Fresnel, as you can see. And it's hard to see the lens, but you see the barn doors. The barn doors are the flaps in front. The flaps can be used to narrow the beam, like the area that the light is falling into. So it's like cropping. You're cropping, cropping the zone that it's falling into. Now, why is that important? Because if you bring up all the lights, they spill everywhere. You know, the lights, um, 
They don't know what you want. <laughs> they have a mind of their own. And you don't want the light to necessarily spill everywhere. I think some people have a philosophy, and this is kind of like typical of, historically typical of the way that producers have done their lighting at CAN TV, and I'm sure a lot of access centers, it's like they, the, the idea is to do it as easy as possible, as quick as possible. We get it, we understand that an hour isn't much time, but you have to strike a balance because if you just take the, the easiest path, your lighting is not necessarily going to dazzle anybody. It's not going to be interesting. It's going to be flat. And flat lighting, unfortunately, that's, that seems to be um, something that's happening throughout the television industry. In general, you see television stations that are like more and more automated, less and less personnel who are doing the art of lighting, uh, because lighting really is an art. And so they just put up a lot of LEDs, uh, flat panel stuff, basically, these days. And they just wash the set like it's, it's, a, it's as if you're in a cloud. It's just this soft, ambient lighting that doesn't have much shape to it. And so that's the trend these days because it's cheaper. You don't have to hire a lighting technician. You don't have to have a lighting designer. You don't have to spend time adjusting those lights and making the look you know, unique. No, they just have them bolted in place. They just have these you know, soft diffusion in front of them. And it's just like you're in a cloud. And to me, I find it so boring. It's just the most boring lighting. I have missed the old television classic days of three-point lighting. And that's why we still teach three-point lighting at Can TV, and why we encourage you to do three-point lighting. Um, that why not? We've got, yes, we have everything is LED in here, but that doesn't mean you have to act like, you know, let's just, let's just throw up all the lights and get on with the show. Um, you know, there are some people, that's the only choice they have. They don't have a big crew. They may have one person helping them. And they don't have a lot of time or energy. Maybe somebody's a little older, and they might not want to get up on the ladder over and over again. That's understandable. You know, we're not saying, don't, don't, don't just bring up all the lights. Don't do boring lighting. No. We understand. Um, you got to focus on what works for you. But if you have the desire, and you have the creativity, we encourage you to think deeper about lighting, to make an actual effort, you know, do what you call three-point lighting, which is key, fill, and backlight, and then embellish that. Because key, fill, backlight, that is a starting point. That is not the end all. And you don't even have to like, always use all three of those. You know, sometimes you use less. So let's talk about that. With this set, the idea was to make it kind of upbeat, uh, bright, Fairly even lighting. You know, it's, let's, let's just say this, this is a talk show. And we want to talk about current topics. We want to talk about these guys are here to talk about, you know, everything that's going on right now in the country. So it's, it's stormy days, as we can see from the cookie back here. So, you know, it's going to have, the topic is going to have a little edge to it. So therefore, we don't want the light to be too bright and too flat. We want to have a little edge to it. And so the, the idea is to make... The ratio, that's how you control the mood, the mood of your show, is the lighting ratio between your main lighting, which is your key light, your key lights, and your fill lights. So the key light causes dark shadows on the other side of the face and the body, causes dark shadows. And so how dark do you want those shadows to be? You know, that, that is what I mean by a key to fill ratio. So that relationship. Now, if you want it to be roughly, like I say, a happy, upbeat, bright kind of show, then that key to fill ratio should be roughly two to one. It could be even three to one. You know, in other words, the key light could be twice as bright or three times as bright as your fill light that's trying to fill in the shadows. So two to one, three to one ratio is good for your average kind of talk show. Um, here we kind of did that. I would say we went for a three to one. It's some, maybe a little bit more than three to one, but three and a half to one ratio. Um, so that's something you have to also think about in advance when you're planning your show. You know, what's the mood of the show? How, how, how edgy do you want it? Or how peppy, how bright, how happy do you want it? You know, these are, these are cliches, you know, these, these lighting scenarios, but, um, but they're true, you know, they're true. They, you know, when it's, something's all bright and everything and colorful, and as you can see in the background here, we've got all these like colorful lights that are highlighting these, these uh, 
these little divider things back here, these screens. You know, that's, 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 that's what we're going for. We, don't, we want people to feel comfortable. We want them to feel entertained. It's like eye candy, all these colors. And you might notice that the, the lights on, that are behind those screens, they're kind of oscillating. They are, they are going from color to color. And that's, we've never, I've never tried that before. This is a first for me. And I think I like it. <laughs> it's, it's giving a little more energy to, to these dead guys that are sitting here. Uh, yeah, because they're not saying much. So yeah, I just decided, let me make some colorful lights in the background. Might as well make them oscillate a little bit. You know, things like that. There you go. You see one of the lights that's going through its, its changes beaming at the screen. Um, so that's a choice you have. There's little settings on the back of the light. There's little buttons on the back of the light. We can show you those. We can do a session with you, a practice session for those of you that are certified. We'll go through how to make those lights do that. We have four of those lights, so yeah, the possibilities are four. <laughs> four possibilities. No, I don't know. Do the math. Anyway, yeah, there's another one on the floor there. Just taken off the stand, placed down on the floor, aiming straight up to give us a little shaft of, of light just going up, the, up the, uh, the, the divider there, going up the screen. So we got you know, creative with it. We decided to try our hand at that. Um, so, you know, some of this was thought of in advance, and some of it was inspired at the moment. You know, it's, that's how it works. You can come up with a plan, but don't be rigid. If it doesn't go totally by your plan, I wouldn't get up too upset. No, nothing ever does. Nothing ever follows the plan perfectly. So be, you know, flexible. Um, be willing to make changes, and sometimes they're, they're good changes, they're happy changes. You know, some of these things that we see right here on the set were just last minute decisions. And so that's also part of your, your lighting plan, is, is being a little bit flexible. And plus you don't know, are these people going to come in wearing the colors that you want them to wear, or something totally different. And so you might have to make some adjustments to your colors. And luckily, these LEDs, especially on the side curtains that are lighting up the white, Side curtain back there are at the touch of a button, you can change those colors. And so, yeah, control room crew, feel free to change those and show people that if you like. Um, have fun with that. So, the planning, you, you draft it out, you know, you can sketch it out, you can decide, okay, what are my key lights going to be? Um, what are my fill lights going to be? What is my lighting design going to be? So there's Andrea. She's going to show us a little bit of some of those changes in the lighting board. So she touched, uh, first of all, she selected. Do you want to explain it, Andrea, or should I explain it? Um, yeah, I can explain it. Hi, Go guys. Go for it. <laughs> all right, so yeah, here I am in um, the control room. Let's so cut to uh, the control if room. I want to adjust the, um, the colored lights, the psych lights, as they're called, they're all on um, faders one, two, three, and four. Uh, just like on the lighting plot that Eric showed you. And then if I want to change the color of a light, so let's say I want to change number two, those are the lights that are hitting straight to the back. And so if I select number two over here, then I can um, go over here at the bottom. It might be hard to see on your screen, but I've got a little color wheel here. So if I click on the color wheel, then this shows me a bunch of colors I can choose from. Again, it might be a little too hard for you to see. But I can also go and show and pick any color of the rainbow. So you see right now, just using my finger on the touchpad, I'm scrolling through every color of the rainbow here. And so you can do that on any of the psych lights. So those are the ones against the wall. The other lights, all the other ones, those, if you want to change the color, then you have to use gels. That's it. Okay. Great. All right, back in the studio here, I want to continue acclimating you to how to approach a lighting setup. So let's say you, you did your plan, and you've got your game plan. You've got enough people to do it. I would say you need at least two people to really effectively do lighting. Today we did all this with two people. Um, one person doing the, the grunt work, climbing up ladders, adjusting lights, putting gels on lights, etc. The other person on the lighting board, as Andrea is, and so what you would want to do is open up your mics. There's two overhead mics hanging up here. So on your audio board, you would want to fade those up so that you could be heard in the control room. 
And then you can ask for certain lights to be brought up. And so you're going to want to have your lighting plot with you. We do have one here at CanTV laminated. You can just refer to it and ask for certain lights to be brought up. Now my strategy is, well, first of all, you don't want to bring cameras out yet because they're going to get in the way. So you want to separate your cameras, spread them out a little bit, but keep them back by the wall so you can get your ladder in and out in those areas that you need them to be. And so, yeah, you're going to start with your key lights. That's how I typically like to work. Everybody who does lighting design, every, you know, lighting designers and cinematographers, they all have their own approach. So what I'm saying is my approach. This is what I have developed after doing this, you know, for a while. It's a suggestion, but, you know, different people that have good ideas. And so definitely listen to different people on this. But my approach is start by doing your key lighting. So your key lights, why do you want to start? Because the key lights are your main lights. You've got to, and they're the hardest ones to do. They need the most adjustment, the most care. So start with your key lights. Get your key lights out of the way. Once the key lights are done, you proceed to your fill lights. The fill light, because, because the key lights cause dark shadows, and you need to start thinking about how bright do you want those shadows to be, or how dark do you want them to be. So after key lights, you do fill lights. After fill lights, backlights, you know, to make a subject stand out from the background. Now, I don't have a backlight on me right now. We didn't set up a special backlight for me, but all these guys on the set, they do. They all have backlights to make them stand out more you know, from the background. Because otherwise, they could blend into the background. Now, if, they're, if they have bright yellow hair, you know, then no, they'll, probably, they'll still stand out from the background. But a little backlight is even better. It, it'll really put, make them, like separate them you know, from the background if you take the time to put a backlight on them. So that's the, that is the game plan. So starting with key lights. Um, Key lights, you know the rule, most of you, some of you. The rule is, say the talent is looking at a particular camera, and they're going to be that way most of the time. Your key light should not come straight on them, because that will flatten them. They'll look like cardboard. Key light should come from a 45 degree angle. It could be from the right side of them or from the left side of them. Which side? It would be the side, I personally would choose the side that is being favored by the cameras that are out here. If, uh, if I put key light on the other side, but, you know, then, then that's the side that's going to be bright. The cameras are going to see the, the shadowy side. It's like, you know, which side of the moon do you want to see? So choose the side favored by the cameras, 45 degrees. And that means if you take a right angle, you know, here straight, my shoulder is pointing 90 degrees off to the side, halfway between those. You're going to, and it doesn't always work out perfectly. It's not always exactly 45 degrees. That light might not cooperate. It might be 40 degrees. It might be 50 degrees, but roughly 45. And so, you know, let's, let's just take some of these guys as examples. So our host here is facing this way. All right. And the shoulder is going that way. So halfway between that. And so it's easy if you stand where they are and then look at that angle halfway between and then look up and see what choices you have. You see what light choices you have. And usually the Fresnel light is the way to go. The Fresnel light is the stronger light. It's more, as I was saying, it's more flexible. It has adjustability. There are a lot of things you can do with a Fresnel light that you cannot do with these astrolites. So I'm looking for a Fresnel that's roughly 45 degrees you know, in that direction. And so I've identified it. Looking at my lighting plot, I can see that his key light appears to be number six. And so I would say to my you know, lighting assistant, or, uh, I'm not sure what title she wants to be called, but anyway, I would say to Andrea, hey, Andrea, can you bring up Number six, and assuming that our mics have been turned on up here, that's what she would do. She would fade up number six. Now, usually you start with it full strength, and that's so that you, know, you can aim it, you can see where that light is going, and so on and so forth. And so you would get up on the ladder, 
and, and adjust that. So let's try that. I'm going to go up the ladder. I'm going to adjust another light, actually, that we have a ladder already set up for. So I'm going to head over there. And that one is on fader number eight. So let's talk about that. So heading up the ladder. And we want to make sure this ladder is anchored on the floor. Some people don't bother, and it starts moving on them. So as you can probably see, the ladder is aiming towards the set. This is also a good thing to do, good practice. Don't have your ladder sideways, where you're having to like look lean sideways. That's not safe. Also, aiming towards the set, you can really see what your lighting is doing. So you get behind your light and start by loosening the two knobs on the sides. And they're kind of like this. Like the one on the left goes clockwise. The one on the right is also going clockwise. So your hands are doing like that. So you loosen those. And then you loosen the light. You tilt it up and down. You swivel it left and right. Because it's like it has arthritis. When it sits here for a while, it gets all stiff. And so it's hard to adjust. It's going <coughs> So loosen it up. And then you can aim it at your subject's chest. You aim it at their torso. And once you think you have it at their torso, you can lock your knobs. Now, I've done this a while. For people who've done it a while, they can just tell. They can see with their eye where that light is going. Other people, maybe it's a little harder. If you're just starting out, I, I, you know, I'm not going to assume that your eye is going to be able to pick that out effectively. So what you could do is you could have someone else go up onto the set. I'll demonstrate that as well in a moment. And they can run their hand around that subject up and down and left and right to figure out where the light is centered. So where is that light spotted? Because the light will have a little hot spot. Now right now you're not going to probably not going to see it too well because I have a diffusion gel. So let me take the diffusion off. And there we go. Now we can see it better. Um, so he can tell me, oh, OK, tilt it down, or pan it left, or pan it right. He can, he can instruct me. Tilt it up a little? All right. How's that? Look, looks pretty good? Good. OK, I'm going to lock it down. Now, this, this light is not 45 degrees. You may have noticed that. The guy is angled away from us, away from this light. This is, this is almost approaching a 90 degree angle. So this actually is not the only key light I'm using for this particular subject. Um, we have another key light that is more you know, along the 45 degree angle. You know, because I just wanted to cover my bases. I wanted to make sure that he was well lit um, because the other light is also not perfectly 45 either. And so this is there sometimes when you have to cheat a little bit. You've got to fudge. And so this is a case where I'm using two key lights for one subject to make sure I've got him covered well, more or less from one side of his body. So there are little things where you have to fudge it a little. Now, I also put diffusion on this light. I'm going to talk about that in a moment, to soften it because it was looking kind of harsh to me. So I'm going to come down and show you guys some of those choices for diffusion. Oh, before I come down, since I'm here, <laughs> let me take advantage of being here. That's another thing that you learn little by little. It takes time, but you learn to take advantage of your positioning because let's say I did the one thing to this light and then decided to go move this ladder somewhere else and work on another light, but then realized, oh, there's other things that I had to do to this light. Then I have to move the ladder all over again over here. That takes time and energy. So while I'm here, I should do as much as I can with this light. So other things that we do are, after we adjust the position of the light so that it is centered on the torso, we then have to decide how strong it is and what area it's covering. And so what we're going to do is we ask the person on the lighting board to spot, which means make it more intense, or flood the light. So I will say, 
could you uh, flood out light number eight a little bit? So once again, I'm going to take off this, this diffusion so you can see the effect of that better. So Andrea, do you mind flood out number eight? Let's see what that looks like. Here I am over on the lighting board. And so I if I want to adjust certain feet. light, I just right select now. number eight. That's what he asked usually, me to adjust. Usually, you know, on the lighting board, oh. maybe she's explaining it. <laughs> okay, yeah. It? Okay. All right. Um, so, yeah, I'm over here at light number eight, so I just selected it. Um, it's highlighted now. And then if I come over to the screen, there's a button that says controls. I hit that button that says controls. There's a button that says param for parameters. I select that. And then there's this little button here that has a number on it. It might be a little too fuzzy for you guys to see. But if I just press and hold on that number and I go up, that means I'm spotting the light. And then if I go down, that means I'm flooding it. So here I am again. Here's me spotting it. Isn't okay, it all the so way spotted? So she is able to make it softer or more intense. Usually we have found that the Fresnel lights look pretty good as key lights when the number is roughly around you know, somewhere between 150 and 165. There's a scale on the lighting board that like goes up to, I think it's 255 or something like that. Um, so roughly around 160 is a good sweet spot. And so yeah, I will, I will often just say, hey, um, okay, let's take it to the sweet spot and she knows what I'm talking about and it looks pretty close. And then we can go from there, just make it either more intense and spotted or more flooded. Um, okay, so before we were trying some experiments and I put some diffusion on here, so I'll put that back on. But also we have to decide where the light is falling on the set. Where, what area is it hitting on the set? Sometimes you don't want it to go broad. Oftentimes you don't want it to go broad. Um, you don't want it, for example, if you're planning on doing lighting on your cyclorama curtain, which we are, you don't want your key lights hitting the curtain because they will wash it out and your, your effect for your cyclorama curtain, your color effect is going to get washed out. And so you want to try to limit where your key lights are falling and that's one of the purposes of these barn doors is to do that and they rotate also so you can match the angle that you need it to, to fall upon. You know, sometimes you want that to be, to, to be parallel with the curtain, for example. And so you're gonna use your barn doors. There's top and bottom and side ones. And so it's up to you to decide how, how much to spread that light. So sometimes there's a large area you're covering. And so therefore you're gonna want it, the beam to be wider. And you're gonna probably also want your barn doors to be at least the side ones to be open wider. There are times when you have audience members in here and maybe not nowadays you know like i said there's a much more of a limit to how many people can come in so so down the road a little and we start opening it up again to more capacity hopefully that's a that's a good day to look forward to we can have audiences and we do have some footage of some shows we can roll that in at our leisure and show you examples of what that looks like with audience members we don't want the key lights hitting the backs of their heads and making them wash out or making them too bright and taking attention away from the set itself, from the characters, from the, <laughs> the talent on the set. And so in that case, we would bring up the bottom barn door. We would want to like keep that light from hitting the backs of people's heads. So we would bring that bottom barn door up and it takes experimentation. But um, another thing you can do, that's one of the reasons we put some diffusion up here is sometimes you just want to mask off half of the beam. You want the, the light, majority of the light, hitting your talent on your set, but then there's another area in the foreground that you might not want such, such a strong beam hitting. In that case, you can use things like diffusion. It'll soften that light, or you can use neutral density filters. Neutral density filter is like a dark gel, a dark plastic sheet that reduces the intensity of the light. So I'm gonna come down again and show you some of those materials that you have at your disposal. And maybe these guys can roll some footage of some of the studio examples, some of the shows we've done. The Laugh Out Loud show, the um, 50th anniversary of the Black Panthers. There you go, there's, there's a scene where the audience is, 
mostly kind of uh, in the dark, and that's for mood. You know, we wanted, it was the subject of the show was a, a very, you know, deep uh, theme. And so we wanted people to feel comfortable. We wanted them to feel a little bit anonymous, you know, a little bit like, you know, that the focus isn't on them. And so we kind of kept the lighting low for them. Um, yet we did want to show them. We wanted to show this participation. We wanted to show this sense of community here. So we did what you call low key lighting. Low key lighting is where there's a lot of darkness <laughs> with low key lighting. Now here the Laugh Out Loud show is a whole other animal. This is, this is a, a comedy show. We want it to be upbeat and positive and, and, and more participatory of an audience. So we wanted to make them more visible. So we brought up more light, but also there's a lot of color on them. We put a lot of gels on our fill lights and all the other sorts of lights that we have angled towards the audience. You can see the ladies in the foreground have sort of a blue cast to them. Other people have a more amber, the gentleman without a lot of hair back there. He's got sort of an amber, amber cast of light on him. You know, and as you can see, not a lot of light coming from behind them. It's toned down because that light is kind of cruising over their heads towards the comedians on the set. And so we had to bring that barn door up on those key lights. And, and we had to put on some materials and some of the Astro, you know, LED panel lights to keep them from being washed out. We wanted them to be kind of low key. All right, so now we're gonna look at some large area lighting for a variety show. Similarly, it's bright. It's what you call high key lighting. So there's a lot of key light. The area is large, there's a band back there. So quite a bit of lighting had to be done. Now the host in the foreground there, he's the main guy. He's got to get the most attention. So we need him to be the brightest and also the lighting is even on him. It takes, it takes work to get your key lights to be nice and even, and you have to anticipate the area that he is going to be performing in. So take that into consideration and light accordingly. Now he's also got some nice backlight on him. It has an amber gel, a little bit of a glow, a little golden edging on him, making him stand out from the bluish background. The bluish background is on purpose, you know, it's like that's another way to draw attention to people to create a contrast, not just with the key to fill ratio and things like that, but also with color. So if your subject is kind of golden, kind of on the yellowish side of the spectrum, then your background would be good if it was more blue or purple or something like that that can contrast as this gentleman is, as you can see, He's got a nice bronze kind of lighting on him and the background was made more bluish. So there's all these little tricks, these things you can do. Here we were using some effects. We have the lights set to sort of a lightning flashing effect because it's a tap dancing show. We wanna give it a lot of energy. So therefore the lighting is, is part of that. The lighting is like one of the dancers. It's another dancer. It's giving a rhythm. It's mimicking the rhythm of the dancing you can change the rhythm of, of those effects. You can totally decide like how fast do I want this lightning to flash and just dial it in. And so, yeah, I think, you know, just watching the dancers, you got a sense of their rhythm and they, they rehearsed before, before they recorded the show. So you could adjust the light to match that rhythm. And there's also some black panels back there just to break it up, to give us our eye a break. You know, just certain areas are just black uh, so that it's not just a uniform, you know, kind of scenario there. So there's a lot you can do with that. Now I did talk about a little earlier, all these different things you can do to, to supplement your lights. So let me show you those. Uh, the colored plastic sheets, these are called gels. And that stands for gelatin. They come in a lot of different colors. Gelatin because the original ones way back in the early part of the 20th century were made literally from gelatin, from animal byproducts. But you know, they weren't heat resistant and they would catch fire and melt and things like that. So these modern materials, they're a lot more heat resistant. They're not made from gelatin anymore, but they're still called gels. So you have, you have to acquire these yourself by and large. Cantity does have some, some gels here. 
Um, but they're kind of old and used. They come from the old studio, actually. And so we, we encourage you to buy your own gels. We're going to give you a resource list of some places that do sell those. And when you buy them, they typically come, you can buy them in different sizes, but this is a typical sheet. This is a typical size, you know, that they sell them in. So hopefully you can see that. There's our resource list, different places. Now, one thing, one, one place that isn't on the resource list, which hopefully will return to, to being on that list, is Central Camera, which, of course, in, the, in, the, in the, the, the ruckus, the uprising, whatever term you want to use that happened a few, about a month ago, uh, they, they were burned down. Um, so, but this is a favorite place, of, a perennial place that uh, can TV producers like to go, Central Camera down in Wabash. They want to come back into business. I, I'm not plugging them. I'm just saying it's another place on the resource list that you can consider going when they get back up and running. Um, anyway, so when you acquire these sheets, you're typically going to want to cut them into sections that work for you. Uh, you know, roughly this big will be plenty for uh, one of these lights that we have in here. Other choices you have, you also have diffusion. This is a Diffusion kit, you can buy them as kits or you can buy them separately. You can buy them as sheets and cut them up. And they have names like frosted. This is a frosted gel, a frosted diffusion. Um, or silk, it has a sort of a silkiness to it, a little stripy texture to it. They have different you know, effects on the lighting. Um, oh, here, this one's even more obvious. So you might be able to see the lines on that, I'm not sure. Yeah, you can see those lines. You know, they, they, they disperse, they, they soften the beam of light in different ways, in different degrees. So you can get yourself some diffusion in the different types that you, that you might decide you need. And how, you know, as far as how do you decide? Well, all these different places that provide these things, they have these little gel uh, swatches, these little kits, it's like carpet samples. Um, you just have to look at them and as you can see, there are quite a few. And so some of them are called color correction gels. Others, diffusion. Others are called neutral density. As I mentioned before, the neutral density gels cut down the intensity of the light. Um, and you have to decide how dense of a neutral density you want. You might want to get a neutral density that is not too dark because, you know, these lights, they're, they're great, but they're not necessarily pumping out a lot of foot candles, a lot of intensity. And so I would recommend you get a medium, a medium toned neutral density gel. And if necessary, you can double it up. And some of the neutral density gels also have a color to them. And so that's a, another thing that's a possibility if you wanna double up uh, functions instead of two separate gels, you could get a gel that does both Things. So neutral density, which cuts down intensity and a certain color. That's another way to go. There's also little scrims. Scrims have little holes cut in them. There are reflectors. Uh, reflectors I would use more for field production, but if you say you bring in your own lights, you know, you could get some mylar and put it up on a board or something and bounce light off of it. You know, that's a way to so another way to soften light and, and spread it out over a large area is by using you know, a large sheet of mylar like this. Um, but you can also use a white card and get a piece of foam core, for example, and just get, get it from craft store. You don't have to spend a lot of money and then just come up with a way to mount it. And then we've got something called black wrap. Black wrap is like aluminum foil painted black. And this can be used also on these lights. They can just be, you know, molded over part of the light so that it stays there and then you can shape it. And that's another kind of extension to the barn door. It's just kind of a more subjective barn door, you know, that you can use this to mask off different areas of lighting. There's also another way to cut down on intensity of light, screen. You can use a piece of screen. This is just metal screen. This, is, this was good when the lights used to be hot, tungsten. Now it doesn't matter so much. So you can use any kind of screen. But yeah, a piece of screen is another way to reduce 
uh, the harshness of light. So you may have subjects who maybe they don't like the way they look on camera. Maybe they want the light to be softer to, you know, reduce some features they have. You can use all these little tricks to do that. And then one more typical thing in my lighting kit here, uh, I would bring a flashlight with you <laughs> to Can TV because it gets dark in here and you have to identify lights, as I was saying before, to tell your lighting assistant what light to bring up. And the lights all have numbers on them. And so you're gonna need a flashlight to see the number and call it out. Now there are two sets of numbers on there. There's a three digit big number and there's a, another sticker with just two digits. The two digit is what you want. You wanna go with the two digit smaller number. Okay, so now that I've got my lighting plan and I've got my materials, I've got my plot, I've done my key light, I would then wanna do my fill lights. And the fill light is fairly straightforward. It's just the opposite side from the key light. It's 45 degrees on the other side. Sometimes your, your fill lights and even your key, light, key, your key lights can do double duty. So let me see if I can find an example here. I think this is an example. So this backlight, the backlight that's hitting our host here, it's, it's covering that, but it also continues in space and it diminishes. It's the inverse, uh, the inverse of the distance. So it falls off quickly. And so it can serve as a fill light for other people. And so then you don't have to do it, take special, you don't always have to take extra you know, efforts to fill in your, your shadows. Your, your key lights can do that. Your key lights can continue on or sometimes your fill lights or sometimes your backlights can do double duty. They might serve as a backlight for somebody and then also continue on and help fill in somebody else. So that's another way to save time is think of ways that your lighting can do double duty, can serve two functions. Now it's not always that simple. You might have a backlight on somebody that ends up being too bright as a fill light. In that case, you can do, if you want to, you can just try some more tricks. You can go up to the light, you can take some of that diffusion material I was showing there, or neutral density gel, cut a strip of it, and mask off half of that beam so that the part that's continuing to another part of the set is toned down, it's tamed. You know, so you can still get away with it. You can use the one light for the two things. If you can start thinking a little more three-dimensionally, you know, start thinking of using some of these materials to get more control over that beam. It's not just one single light doing one single thing. It's a beam that can be shaped. It can be, it can be trimmed, it can be softened. You know, lots of things can happen to that beam. You can make half of the beam a different color than the other half of the beam. You know, but it's, it does help to think this through. And if you're gonna do a show at Can TV, definitely helps to do a practice session before your actual show. So you can do a run through with some of these concepts and see how they're actually playing out. How do they actually work and how long does it take to set that up? So there's, uh, there's a lot to it. It takes time. Um, there are also more features than we have time today to talk about on the lighting board. The lighting board can store settings, for example. It can store, we have stored this, this look of this set as a playback. Um, so we can fade up one fader and it brings up all these lights. And then we have another part of the set that's stored in another playback. And so we can go to and cross fade those and we can go to that other look. And, and you know, that other look may also have involved a lot of lights. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't, but you know, it's easier to set those up and store them as playbacks and then make use of them than it would be to start trying to like make all these you know, complex adjustments to all the different faders on your lighting board just because your talent walks to another part of the set and that part of the set needs to be a little bit different. So anyway, um, hopefully this all helped you know, get you started and, and demystified some of lighting for you. Uh, we wanna open it up to questions, I think. Uh, I think I've mostly covered what I needed to cover today. 
Um, so if people have questions, we will, we will definitely try to cover those. We'll try to, try to attend to those. So thanks for watching. We're going to make this available as a recording to watch again. And um, ah, the cookie, I didn't really say too much about the cookie. I wanted to just quickly uh, explain that. <clears throat> the cookie that you're seeing behind me was cut out of a pie pan. <laughs> So step one is buy a pie and eat the pie. All right, and then step two, you're gonna be using a guide. We have this guide here that, that has the exact dimensions of the cookie holder that's in the ellipsoidal light. And you can see those there. You can use this as a template. So the holder is on your left there and the cookie itself is over here. And so you have to do a design that fits in this circle. And this square is just simply cut out of this pie pan. As you can see, I've got a square hole here. And this was made really quickly right before the, <laughs> right before the show today. I literally made it in under 10 minutes. So, you know, uh, this isn't really a workshop on cookie making, I'm just summarizing, but basically, you know, trace this, these dimensions through little cut holes onto this pie pan. And then on the pie pan, I just drew my little lightning bolt design back there and um, used a sharp knife, an X-Acto type knife to cut out that pattern. And then it's just a matter of taking, you know, taking that, that cookie, making it backwards and upside down putting it in the, the cookie holder, putting it in the ellipsoidal light, and then it casts that pattern. And, and then you put it upside down backwards because the lens, the lenses will, they'll flip the image horizontally and vertically, they, they reverse it. So you have to reverse your, your cookie so that it, it puts it up there right. And then, you know, we also threw a gel on it, a little blue gel, just to give it a little, you know, mood, a moody, rainy day kind of mood. And there you go. We've got a nice design and you just aim it and, you know, put your light where you need it to be. And you've got a design. Now, these kind of, these kind of things can also be done as graphics. You can bring it up as a graphic. Um, but there's a lot of possibilities. So once again, I think I've covered a lot of what I wanted. And so thank you for watching. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask and we will try to answer those. So thanks for watching, everybody. And please come to our future workshops. We like to hear suggestions from you. We design workshops around what people uh, feel that they want to learn. And so if we, can, if we can cover it, we will try to cover that. So write to us at CANTV uh, by writing to training at cantv.org. You can write to me personally if you like to e Torres E-T-O-R-R-E-S at cantv.org or to Andrea Alberti. A-A-L-B-R-B-E-R-T-I at cantv.org. And we will try to get back to you as soon as we can. We're gonna just say goodbye then. And uh, thanks for watching everybody. So take care. <laughs>